Hey everybody, this month's roundup is brought to you by Arcane Wonders, and hello everybody. You may notice I'm in a different environment. We are in the Moho, our 9-ton, 31-foot motorhome that we have now hit the road with. Jen and I have embarked on a multi-month magical mystery tour all the way to the southern tip of Baja, uh, Mexico, and then coming back home. And so you're going to be seeing me filming probably from this dinette for the next few months at the very least, as I tell you about all the games that Jen and I played over the preceding month. Although, uh, it's because of the trip that this is going to be a shorter roundup than normal. I've only got 10 games to talk about because we spent so much time in October getting ready for this trip. I expect the volume will pick up uh, in November and December and January and February and who knows when we're going to be home. But for now, folks, 10 games, all of them good to great. And as always, I'm going to do it in countdown format, starting with my least favorite, ending with my most favorite. And I think I've got this set up correctly. I think, fingers crossed, I'm in a whole new environment. Uh, the Starlink hopefully should stay uh, linked or lunk so that I can bring you number 10 on the list, Heat pedal to the metal. Actually, I got a chance to play this at Funicon, a new board game convention in Eugene, Oregon that Jen and I attended. We had a great time. Chaz Marler of Watch It Played and Paradise Paradise, Pair of Dice Paradise was there too. Chaz actually taught me how to play this and I played two games. One is the basic and then one with a bunch of the modules turned on and I can definitely now see why so many people rave about this game. Why it made so many top tens of the year. Why people were outraged it didn't get the spiel to Yaris and all of that. And I get it. It's a brilliant game all about racing cars by playing cards. Really smartly done. A lot of fun systems as you deck build your way to, uh, to Days of Glory. Um, that's the Tom Cruise movie, right? Anyway, though, here's the thing. As much as I respect it and appreciate it, one... I don't particularly care about the subject matter at all. Driving around in huge ovals, even fancy ovals with sharper and, and um, uh, shallower turns is just... Uh, you need something a little bit more uh, than just that to pull me in. And the interesting thing, I, I think the whole concept of the heat cards, uh, which... You can spend as a resource, and then they go into your deck, um, you know, and uh, kind of clog up the deck until you can cool down and get the heat back out of your hand and into the engine. I thought that was really, really cool. I like that quite a bit. And even more, I love the idea of kind of this push-your-luck system where every round you can draw additional cards and see, okay, can I just get a few more steps so I can get in position, so I can draft behind another card and slingshot around a corner. All this stuff is very, very cool. But to play the game at peak efficiency, See, this is a memory game where you have to remember, as my deck gets bigger and bigger, right, have I played this card yet? How many cards in my deck are still low versus high values? And the rules go out of their way to say you can never look at your discard pile. So you have to play at peak efficiency to really excel. You have to memorize way more than I like. So um, the reason this comes in at the bottom of my list is a combination. I don't really care about the subject matter. I'd rather be racing cute little Kubitos creatures um, and, uh, you know, with that dice uh, building from um, Aldrak and uh, John D. Clare. But more importantly, the introduction of a memory element that I don't think needed to be there really kind of brought it, brought it down for me personally a little bit. But again, I respect the heck out of this. I can see why it is so hugely popular and so successful. Number 10 on the list is Heat pedal to the metal. Now, let's go on to number nine, something a bit more near and dear to my heart, hens. Uh, this is a game all about raising a barnyard of hens. I haven't got a film of it, so let me just go on and uh, show some pictures of it on Board Game Geek here. And first of all, let me just say, this game is drop-dead gorgeous. It gives me an appreciation for why my wife loves uh, raising hens so much, because they are beautiful birds, and the art on this game is just gobsmackingly gorgeous. And it is a very sharp and fun, puzzly uh, tile land game, too, or card land game. Because what we're trying to do over the course of 12 rounds is, at the beginning of a turn, you draw two cards, you play one, and you discard one. So the first cool trick is, whenever you discard a card every round, it goes to the top of your discard pile, and uh, all the other players around the table then could take that. Because we all start by drawing two cards. You can draw blind, or you can draw off the top of somebody else's discard pile. So you've got that Lost Cities vibe thing going, right? Where you're just like, ah! 
If I, I think you really want this card, I don't want to play it, but I don't want to give it to you, but it's clogging up my hand. What am I going to do? And that stuff is done very, very nicely. I will say, I think the game is better at a higher player count than a lower player count, because as a two-player game, there is only one other discard pile, one opponent. Whereas if you're playing at a four-player game, there are three other places you could go to digging for cards. And um, so still, I mean, it's a good two-player game, but definitely better and more. Um, but then... That's the discarding part of your turn. The actual playing part is a fun puzzle in itself because you're also going to make a 4 by 3 or 3 by 4 grid of cards. And every time you put a chicken down, it goes adjacent to other chickens. And it either has to be the same breed, in which case you don't care about the number, or if it's a different breed, it has to be either one above or below the number. So if there's a 4, uh, you got to put a 3 or a 5 next to it. And uh, so you've got to work all this out. You need to be thinking about the final card you're going to be playing halfway through the game. You need to be thinking about the mid-game early in the game because it has a lot of uh, clever, sharp planning to get the ideal laid out thing. Plus, every time you play, there's going to be a uh, different collection of objective cards that everybody's chasing after. While all, And then there's one other thing, too. You're going to score your biggest flock of birds and, ideally, your second biggest flock of birds if you put a rooster on it because you've got to anticipate halfway through the game, what is going to be my biggest flock of birds? I do not want to put the rooster on there because then I'd be wasting it because the rooster would be too henpecked, I guess, by the big flock of birds. So you got to put the rooster in a smaller one so you can get extra scoring. So there's a lot of cool things in it. I, I really, and the art is phenomenal. So why is it coming at number nine? Nothing really. It's just, we have played other games that have this same kind of grid, um, you know, and uh, the, the game itself is so simple, so clean, and really kind of spare. As a two-player game, I think it's good. I would definitely rate it higher as a higher player count game because I have three different, um, what you call them, uh, uh, d discard piles. So there's a much bigger, wider range of options, and it kind of cuts away the luck a little bit. Because in a two-player game, there can be luck of the draw that you just get the exact, you draw blind to get the exact card you want. Um, and I just never tend to do it. I mean, the game does have a decent scaling because a lower player count game, you take out a couple breeds of birds. So it all still works out. But I think having played as a higher player count game, that's how I'd want to play it in the future, which uh, just keeps hands at the uh, upper end of the list, number nine of the month. Hands. Oh my gosh, these birds are beautiful. Anyway, let's move on now to number eight on the list, Tipperary, which is a very lovely, uh, fun polyomino game where uh, every turn you are going to get two new tiles in your hand. You're going to play one of them to expand your uh, Irish, uh, you know, beautiful bucolic countryside, and then put the other one back in the, the public supply. What makes this game interesting more than anything else, because, you know, the tiling is pretty straightforward. Uh, they're really cool, funky-shaped polyomino pieces that are tough to jigsaw puzzle together, but very satisfying when you can pull it off. But it's the way you get your pieces. Because at the center of the table, there's a literal old-fashioned spinner. You, at the beginning of a round, you flick the spinner and make it spin. And on the spinner is every player's, you know, um, faction symbol or uh, county crest, I guess. And wherever the spinner lands, those are the two t um, tiles that I have to pick from. And that's really cool. Very old school. Reminds me of my childhood in the 70s. Uh, you know, spinning the uh, Game of Life spinner. And um, so... You can see what all the potential tiles are that you might be able to grab, but you have no idea. There's only a 1 in 5 chance you're going to get it. So, um, and you might think, well, okay, if nobody else took that one and I didn't get this turn, maybe I'll get it next turn. So you can be doing some interesting long-term planning about trying to get them. But again, because it's driven by a spinner, you can never be sure exactly what it is you're going to be able to expand your little uh, county with. And the game, uh, Tile Lang, again, is really sharp with all these fun, odd-shaped pieces and uh, different things they do. Uh, you're you're trying to get uh, ruins next to each other so you can make these cool little 3D towers. You're trying to get distilleries next to grain fields so you can um, brew whiskey or distill whiskey. You're trying to get a big group of sheep together and you're trying to have the biggest group of sheep in the whole game to get five bonus points. There's five different things I think that you're scoring. Each of them works in different ways and it's really sharp. Jen and I liked it quite a bit. I'm pretty sure it's going to be a keeper for us. The only thing that keeps it higher is I kind of... Well, two things. One, that spinner... 
needs a lubricant or something like that because it does not tend to spin anywhere near as much as I'd like. It's literally just a piece of cardboard on top of another cardboard and the friction sets in and you can't really get a good satisfying spin that spins and spins and spins, Wheel of Fortune style. And we were oddly found, we found, it just keeps seeming to land in the same spots every single time. I don't know, maybe that's just something with my copy. I was almost thinking of dropping the spinning and rolling a die, except it's a five-side thing. I mean, do you, can you folks tell me where I could get a five-sided die? I'm sure they must exist. And just rolling a die and saying, okay, let's just rotate it that many times. Because the spinner, um, it's cool in theory, but in practical terms, it just wasn't quite as fun as I'd hoped it would be. But then on top of that, the other thing uh, about the game is, like I said, there are five different ways you can trigger stuff. I would love to see an expansion for this game that um, you know changes things up. Um, so that, hey, you know what, this time the moors do this, or this time the stone circles do that. I mean, as opposed to, it's just five things that are always going to score the same way over and over again. Uh, you know, kind of imagine Carcassonne where you would never get any sort of expansion. I think the base game of Tipperary has a lot of fun playing it, but I would love to see a little bit more variety in the different things that you can score from game to game, as opposed to, I mean, every time you play, you're only going to focus on, you know, maybe three of the five things. It's going to mix up a bit, but I just love to see a a little bit more variety that, hey, now the ruins do something else rather than let you build an extra tower just so there's a little bit more variety from game to game. Don't get me wrong. It's still great. Like I said, it's really brilliant too because it's like a 15-20 minute game. All simultaneous play, no matter the player count, it's going to go fast, fast, fast. And both Jen and I very much enjoyed uh, number eight on the list, Tipperary. Now, let's go on to number seven, Kali Mala with the new Intrigue expansion. And I don't think my video for this is up yet. It'll be going up next week, if I recall correctly, just in time for the uh, crowdfunding launch. But I've been wanting to play Kali Mala for years, literally, um, because it's the first published game from Fabio Lapiano, who is really working his way up into um, you know one of my favorite designers. I've been so impressed by so many of his games. Zapotec, I think, currently is his high watermark, and I've enjoyed all of his games, um, Autobahn and plenty more besides, and I wanted to go back and see where it all started. The interesting thing is, originally Kali Mala was a three-player minimum game, so I'd always skipped it. But a couple of years after it came out, yeah, you know, Fabio revisited and came up with a really solid two-player rule set. And now, uh, it's been picked up by a different publisher, Alley Cat Games. They've got new art overhaul from Ian O'Toole, one of the hottest artists working. They've uh, brought the two-player rules officially in, and they've added a new Intrigue expansion as well. So there is a lot to recommend here. And i got to say, I can see why so many people over the years have said, yeah, this is Fabio, La Fabio Lapiano's best design today, because it's a very, very sharp worker placement game where on your turn you're going to put a little disc out and activate two tiles adjacent. With the Intrigue expansion there are now three tiles you'll activate every time you put a worker out. So turns get bigger and more robust and satisfying. But the interesting thing is just because I put my worker disc on a spot doesn't mean you can't go there. But if you go there and put your disc on top of my disc I get to activate my disc again. And so there's a lot of really interesting interplay between players. I'm just waiting for you to get out of the way because I don't want to give you bonus stuff. But that's the space I need to go to. But Oh, I could probably do it with this other thing, too. It's very, very sharp. I like it a lot, the core structure. But the only thing, personally, that I don't like is this game is really, was it? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12? Or is this like, there's somewhere between 10 and 15 different simultaneous area control battles that are going on in this game at all time. Because you're doing the worker placement to harvest resources, to be able to contribute, to ship goods overseas, or contribute to the construction of buildings. And, you know, and all the kind of euro stuff you do. And uh, every single one of these things, like I said, is a discrete area control battle. And they're all going to pay out at a randomly generated, every time you set up, you're going to say, these are the 15 things we're going to score points on. Uh, yeah, so I guess there's 15 area control battles, right? And we're going to do it in this order. So everybody knows, oh, this city's coming up. We don't have to worry about that city until halfway through the game, etc., etc. And it works great. And really, my only problem with the game is... Boy, you spend a lot of time, really, more so than most, because there are so many simultaneous area control battles. Really, just focus like a laser on trying, or well, me, trying to beat my wife, Jen. And honestly, personally, I tend to be drawn more towards games where I spend most of my time um, just building my own thing, rather than trying to 
best you and your thing. I just want to see at the end of the game who did best overall as opposed to I'm constantly, every couple of rounds, oh, I beat you there. Oh, you beat me there. Oh, I beat you there. And I beat you there. And I beat you. Oh, and then you beat me here. And it's like, that's fine. It's great. I mean, if you love area majority, uh, you know, uh, domination battles, this is one of the best. I mean, where else are you going to get 15 unique ones on a strict schedule? It works great. The worker placement is brilliant. And I got to say, the new Intrigue expansion really ratchets the game up. Takes it to a whole nother level of depth and complexity in a good, good way. So, I really enjoyed my time with it. Even if it's not my favorite Lapiano, hey, it's still a Fabio Lapiano game, and that's not bad. And folks, watch for it. It's going to be crowdfunding soon. Number seven on the list, Kalimala Intrigue. All right. Oh, let the battle begin. All right, then let's move on to... Number five on the list, Critter Kitchen. Now, this is the spiritual sequel to Flamecraft. You know, from the same publisher, same artist, in fact. Although, uh, you know, new designer, new setting. This is a game where we are trying to run the uh, best kitchen in the best bistro in town. Uh, we've got a whole list of customers who want specific meals made. And we're building up to over several rounds to get prepared for mid-game scoring where we try to make the best sandwiches and, um, you know, five, seven-course meals and all kinds of stuff. It's a worker placement game, and the worker placement's very sharp because you have three workers, and every round you're going to send all of them out simultaneously. We have to choose in secret what um, different location we're going to send our workers to to get the ingredients to make the right stuff. And we have a fast worker, a medium speed worker, and a slow worker. The slow worker can pick up the most stuff. The fast worker can pick up the least stuff. And I've got to figure out, right, where are you going to go? Because I need that salami. I need it bad to finish the sandwich because then I'll be able to make a 21 star sandwich. It's going to be amazing. I got to get that done. But the place where the salami is or the cheese or you know whatever it is that you might want, um, there's other good stuff there too. And I think you might go there also. You might not even care about the salami. I know you already picked up a lot of meat in earlier rounds. So do I send my little tiny fast one there so that if I go there, chances are I'll get first dibs, but I'll only get one thing. I'd rather go there with my medium speed worker and get a couple things because there's multiple things I like there. But do I think if I do that that you'll beat me and you'll send your fastest worker there? Um, very, very fun. Really, Shades, it's kind of hard for me to get away from um, drawing parallels between this and one of Jen's and my all-time faves, Dungeon Pets, uh, because of the simultaneous worker placement, trying to you know always compete, and also the brilliant overall structure of knowing, right, this is what I'm building towards. And as, I, as the game goes on, every round, a new thing is revealed. Oh, we have to worry about that three rounds from now. We're going to have to worry about that four rounds from now. We have to worry about that at the end of the game. So there's a really nice mix of short-term, um, you know, opportunistic uh, tactical stuff and long-term strategic planning that I really, really like. I mean, this game, um, I think uh, it's, it's uh, you know, when people get their hands on it, I mean, for me, I mean, Flamecraft is great. I think this game is superior. I think um, Cardboard Alchemy, the publisher, man, they're just building from strength to strength to strength. The only thing that keeps this out of my top five for the month is there is one element. Um, one of the things you can get with your worker placements, instead of getting ingredients you need to make them menus, are clues to reveal secret hidden objectives. And, I mean, they're face down from the get-go. And if I can monopolize those objectives and keep them away from you, I've got a source of points that you can't possibly match. And that just might completely flip the game over there. It works. It's fine. I mean, it's not game-breaking because, you know, you could still win the game never not knowing any of those things. But by the same token, you could say, I'm going to ignore all those. And then, what do you know? It just so happens, by sheer luck, I happen to do really well on the hidden objective anyway. Honestly, I personally would have been fine without that, just dropping the clue things we can draft for or making them do something else and just slowly, over the course of the game, reveal what the objectives are too. Or, heck, even better, start with them all face up. Just so you know right from the get-go. Because hey, you know, all that's going to do is that's going to make the game bigger, heavier, crunchier, um, and give you more things to long-term strategize about. And don't get me wrong. It's fine as it is. It adds an air of mystery. Oh, I know something you don't know. And then you can start paying attention to what am I doing so you can maybe guess what the objective is. It works. I could have done without that part. It's fine. It's just it's the, it's the one thing that we kind of rubbed up against. But even still, the game is fantastic. We enjoyed it. Uh, um... I would probably just maybe do a little bit of a house roll for that. But, man, uh, the worker placement, the simultaneous action selection is just phenomenal. And uh, that comes in at number six of the month, Critter Kitchen. Now, let's move on to number five, Alpujaris. Okay, um, which is the latest from Steve Finn. 
Got a chance to play this at uh, the Funicon convention. Played it with Gen 2 here on the road. And this is a time track game. You know, along the lines of Takedo or Thebes or Glenmore. And um, it's done really, really well. I love a time track game that can actually really incentivize you to make those big leap forwards rather than just taking little baby steps and um, constantly just trying to gobble up everything you can that you are rewarded. And, you know, you know it can be a big part of your strategy for making those big leaps. I always appreciate that, and I think this game does a very good job. It also borrows from Glenn Moore by bringing in a dice-driven, automated third player that you can anticipate where they're going to go. Um, so a two-player game really kind of feels like a three-player game. And it is just fun and sharp. Probably one of the brightest, most colorful games I've seen since Finca, because the game comes with tons of cool, lovely little, colorful um, fruit meeples. Because we're fruit farmers in Alpujarras region. Um, moving on the time track, grabbing actions to either deploy our farmer meeples to the five different regions, and every time you send a farmer to a region, you get fruit. Move them from region to region, which again, gets you fruit. Um, or uh, harvest stuff from regions. If you've got a majority of farmers in a, a region, you can harvest stuff. Now, you need to get all this fruit because one of the other actions you do is deliver the fruit, either to the individual villages that have specific things they want, um, or to a kind of preset, like, public display. And so, you're constantly trying to get the right set of fruit to be able to make really big payday deliveries uh, every once in a while. On top of that, there are multiple objectives that change from game to game that really focus you um, on different elements. And yeah, it's, I mean, I didn't even talk about everything. There's the whole irrigation gameplay element. Um, there's the uh, getting the Norias, these gears that unlock special bonus powers. It is sharp, and it once again shows uh, that Steve Finn is, as always, functioning. This is one of, I think, his best designs to date. And, uh, you know, it's just a really brilliant invented time track system beautiful, lovely, colorful presentation. Uh, thank you, by the way, Kimberly, for doing a video. I'm showing uh, Kimberly's Tabletop Tolson video here. If You can go find more about it if you check out her video. But yeah, it's just sharp and just show, goes to show Dr. Finn Games is, as always, at the top of their game with number five of the month, Al Pujaris. Now, Let's go on to number four, Escape Room Tycoon, which, oh boy, I really had a great time playing this, learning this, and filming this because Alex of Might I Suggest a Game came over just a few days before Jen and I hit the road to teach me how to play, and um, I fell hard in love with this game. I described it, if I recall correctly, as what do you get if you cross Vito Lasarda's The Gallerist with... Um, Oh, oh, uh, Vladimir Suki's Shipyard with Michael Schock's Zuloretto. That's a really interesting combination of mechanisms that just turns into something absolutely lovely as we are all competing to be the best at running an escape room. We're actually a series of escape rooms and uh, you know catering to the needs of you know escape room aficionados, unlocking all kinds of special powers, all of it driven by a very sharp, very uh, simple, streamlined worker placement system, uh, very, very similar to the gallerist. But um, building up those escape rooms feels very much like, hey, am I going to build a lot of little cheap quick escape rooms or am I going to make one real or two really big ones that I spend my whole game working on? Kind of like uh, Shipyard, one of uh, Vladimir Succi's all-timers. But then you got the Zuloretto thing where every round more people are showing up. They're getting in vans. We're choosing what vans to put those in and I might be building the perfect van for you and you might grab it and bring those people into your escape room. So I've always got to pay attention to that too. The game is really crackerjack brilliant. By the way, it's also produced and designed by people who run escape rooms in the real world. So there's an air of authenticity and real strong thematic verisimilitude to it as well. I'm very, very impressed by this game. Number four of the month, Escape Room Tycoon. All right, then let's go on to number three. We've got The Books of Time. Oh my goodness, what a phenomenal game. This is basically... Eh, kind of abstract deck builder. Um, you know, let's say, uh, you know, trying to create inventions and push a civilization through time. That, again, but it's kind of abstract. I really, first of all, let me just say, I am so bummed they did not put words describing what all the different inventions and technological breakthroughs and, um, you know, trade agreements and all these different cards that we get. You can kind of guess what they are. You can look in the appendix of the manual and see, right, 
Tell me the story of my civilization. What have I focused on? But in actual gameplay, you're too busy focused on the goods conversion, so the theme just goes away, and it drives me nuts! I understand they want to be language independent, but you know what? Instead of putting no text on that nobody gets to read, how about just put English text on that at least 50% of your players will get to read, and then the rest of the players can say, well, okay, I don't know what an aqueduct is in my language. I'll go look it up on, you know, in, in the appendix. That would have helped a lot. That really would have pushed the game probably a few notches higher if the theme came through a bit stronger because it's so abstract. But that doesn't matter because I love it anyway. Anyway, it's a deck building game where we have three decks that we are working on. One is about trade, one is about science, and one is about... See, I don't even remember because I just know they're the green, the red, and the yellow books because the words... Publishers, please... A word is worth a thousand pictures when it comes right down to it, when you're trying to very quickly and elegantly explain what is it I'm doing as I build my civilization up. But regardless, regardless. So you've got three different books which represent decks. The thing is, these decks literally get put into little spiral round books. So imagine a deck builder where you have to play the cards in a very specific order, the order that you created them, and you're working on three different um, decks at the same time, which will usually tend to like complement each other. This one will generate stuff that the other one can use. It's really sharp. Um, and the, uh, the fun factor of actually building these little books... And then there's another book, a chronicle book, that means every round there's going to be a new event. Which, again, why aren't there words? Tell us what these events are. Don't just tell us what we do. Tell us what they are so we get a sense of a story. I'm, I'm harping on this too much. This is the thing, folks. This could have been my number one game of the year. This could have pushed into my top ten games of the year. Because I think the core gameplay of a triple... Um, deck building game uh, where you have, uh, you know, where, where you are stuck, or, you know, working with the order that you built the deck in is brilliant. But I needed that theme, and just a few words on cards would have pushed it to the next level. Probably pushed it in my top 10 of the year. One other thing I need, though, you know, this, I'm, I am hoping, quite frankly, that this becomes Publisher Board and Dice's, um, what do you call it? Dominion, right? I want to see more and more expansions. I want to see expansion after expansion after expansion. About because most of the cards in the base game that you can put into your books and build your three decks simultaneously, they're all variations of convert this good to this good, get this good, um, you know, trade in this good for points. They're all pretty straightforward. They're fine, and there's a surprising amount of interplay as you uh, work uh, these things together. But I want to see more fancy, far out. There's a few really interesting things, like powers that let you manipulate the books and stuff like that. I want to see more stuff that really pushes this. Now, I'm fine with it not being here in the base game, but that's why I'm hoping, hoping, hoping it gets expansions that really push this to the next level. Like uh, Donald X. Vaccarino has done over the years, constantly reinvigorating and reimagining what Dominion is, I could totally see this game doing it. And if they just put text on the cards... I could see it ultimately eclipsing Dominion for me. And those are high words. Uh, but anyway, er, strong feelings for number three of the month, Books of Time. Now, let's go on to number two, Undergrove. Oh, baby, Elizabeth Hargraves is back. The uh, designer of Wingspan, I mean, t I mean, that, I don't think that was her first published game, or was it her first published game? I, I, Tussie Mussie, I'm not sure which one came out first. And then she's done, um, oh, the game about the monarch butterflies. What was it called? Oh, I can't think of it. It's from AEG. Wingspan? No, no, Wingspan. My wife's just off camera trying to help me remember. What's another word for monarch butterflies? Oh, that's going to drive me nuts. I'm going to pause and look it up. Mariposas. Oh, Mariposas is fantastic. Uh, Tussie Mussy was very, very fun. But, um, and I have not tried Fox Experiment. I have to admit, I'm a little queasy about the subject matter of that one. But eh, maybe Ruel will cover it on the channel at some point. But anyway, um, Wingspan was amazing. You know, gr GOAT, greatest of all time territory, and deservedly so, a triple engine building game. And the games she's done since then have all been sharp, have all been clever, but really lighter things. Undergrove is Elizabeth diving back into the deep end of the pool. This is a crunchy game where players take on the role of Douglas Fir Trees, um, trying to ensure the um, success and health of their seedlings that they're spreading throughout the forest. And here's the deal, folks. This is a communal engine building game because we spend a fair bit of time putting our tiles on the board that represent a literal mycelial network of fungus that is growing throughout the forest. And the thing that I love about this game is I look around at all the 
the trees around me in my RV right now, I can't look at them the same way after I've seen what is happening under the surface, how these root connections all intertwine with other trees and with these fungal networks and all that, because trees are smart. Trees actually engage in, um, you know, uh, the reciprocal relationships with different types of fungus. And this game models all of that stuff. What's going on in the undergrove is what we're doing. I haven't talked about gameplay yet. I mean, I just love the theme of this so much. It is so eye-opening. But anyway, on your turn, you are, generally speaking, uh, going to do one of a few different actions, and these are either spread your seedlings or place tiles to extend the uh, you know the different mushrooms. Because here's the deal, folks: in real life, trees have enough instinctual knowledge. They know, oh, I need more of this resource. I have to send out into the network these particular resources that I generate to facilitate the growth of this specific type of fungus, so that this fungus will give me or my seedlings what they need. This is stuff that uh, the science believes actually happens now. And the game replicates all that. I am making decisions on behalf of a tree to grow certain types of fungus so that I can get my seedlings over there, so that I can interact with those fungus and either convert resources into other resources, ship stuff around where I need it to go. Of course, as a tree, my number one thing is photosynthesis, creating carbon, because that drives everything, and then sending that carbon out into the mushrooms uh, to power them to trigger their special abilities uh, so I can get my seeds. And it's sharp. Uh, Especially because, like I said, this is the more tiles come out, these tiles all um, interact with other tiles in interesting ways, much like I guess uh, the real world works. And so we are all contributing to a big engine, um, and then trying to run that engine depending on what nodes we have access to, depending on where we put our personal seedlings. And it is sharp. It is crunchy. It is heavy. It is brilliant. It is up there in wingspan territory. In fact, I mean, you can see Shay did a run through for the channel of it. I, I just got a chance to play it. I um, did not actually uh, do anything other than uh, get to play it at the convention. Um, you'll be able to see Shay's video. Or no, Shay's video is already up, so you can check that out. Links for it is down in the show notes, let's just say. But anyway, um, oh man. As Shay put it in his final thoughts, he thinks it's maybe easier to teach than Wingspan because it's much more you know just straightforward. Oops, let me go ahead and rewind there again. I should have put that on loop. Um, easier to teach, but harder to master. And I think he might be right. I was super impressed. I have one complaint about the game. And that is, it doesn't do as good a job as it should really underscoring the fact that this is a race game. This is a, one of those games where it does not have a fixed number of rounds. Um, it's going to end when um, you know, players hit certain achievements. And I found playing it with different people, I played it a couple of times at the convention, if you don't have somebody who's really rushing the end of the game, the game can go on. We spend way too much time building the engine and not enough time using the engine to grow our saplings into trees, little cool 3D um, standee trees. And I kind of wish the game just had a fixed number of rounds. Really, I think uh, you know my wife Jen would agree too. It's fine, but it's just a game where you can fall into this trap. Sometimes you see people on board game be complaining, "This game, I love it, but man, it's way too long." And I'm like, "Well, play it with me because you'll find it's not very long when I'm racing and just trying to use what's there as opposed to building and building and building more infrastructure." Surely you have to stop expanding infrastructure and actually use what you've already built. And this game, it's so fun and compelling to build the infrastructure, you kind of lose sight of the forest for the trees. Literally, it's a little thing. I think the game would have been slightly improved with a fixed number of rounds, but I'm not complaining too much because, man, when people get their hands on it, there's going to be a lot of people who will say, Wing what? What span? It's all about number two of the month on the list, Undergrove. But, folks, number one, oh, there can be only one, and it has got to be Wondrous Creatures, which I had queued this up. I don't know why it's all broken now. Let's go on ahead and skip ahead. There we are, Wondrous Creatures, which, again, oh, I, I muted you. Be quiet. Me. So, this was, again, before we left, I got a chance to play this and learn how to play it from Alex of Might I Suggest a Game. Uh, he did a fantastic job teaching me how this game plays. You can go check out the uh, how to play or the run-through with me and Alex. This game is fantastic, and Jen loved it, too. It was her number one game of the month. It is my number one game of the month. If you'd like to know more about these games from Jen's perspective, by the way, might I suggest um, joining down below at the level that gets you access to the monthly Gen Jog or checking it out on Patreon. Uh, but anyway, both Jen and I agreed this game is phenomenal. And I'm telling you right now, folks, as more people get their hands on it, this is an Everdell killer. I I was so excited about Everdell Farshore earlier this year because I thought Everdell Farshore was such an improvement over regular Everdell. 
but this is an improvement over any version of Everdell. It does, it's kind of the same idea. It's a worker placement game where we're sending workers out onto the central board to harvest resources so we can play cards, and the cards have a million different ways they can combo with each other, and it's so much fun and so satisfying um, with a different set of randomly uh, chosen objectives and, uh, you know, grabbing more cards and trying to find the, uh, the synergy between the cards in your hand and getting them played, start running little mini engines all driven by, well, in Everdell, everything I just described could be uh, applied to Everdell. Here's where it gets very different, though. Everdell is a very simple, vanilla worker placement game. Just put a worker out, get some stuff. Uh, after you're done with workers and playing cards, we'll call them all back. This game, your workers occupy two spaces on this cool little hex layout of the board. And depending on where you put them, you can harvest up to three different resources uh, by, I mean, by putting your workers next to up to three different resource-generating spaces. But... They're multi-use spaces, because whenever you put your worker next to a space, next to a coral space, you have a choice. You can either harvest coral, or you can draft a a fish, a coral card from the public supply. So it's like a every worker has the potential for three multi-use decisions on it. Okay, I'm going to take a coral, and I'm going to take a coral, but instead of taking this flower, I'm going to grab that flower, um, that bird uh, card because it needs a couple of coral to get played. And next turn I'm going to play it and then that's going to trigger this, which is going to get me a trophy and all kinds of stuff. The worker placement, I love the way this works. Uh, also, it's very, very smart. It's a two-sided board. You're looking at the two-player setup, but the board gets bigger and bigger for more players. The workers upgrade over the course of the game, so areas that were previously cut off, only certain players can go to with their workers and you unlock other special powers. The game is freaking brilliant. And um, yeah, there's nothing more to say. It is my number one game of the month. And Gens 2, Wondrous Creatures. And that is it, folks. Uh, ten great games. Um, and uh, we'll be back again next month. So uh, thank you, as always, uh, for supporting the show. And thanks to Arcane Wonders for um, sponsoring the show and bringing it to you. And uh, we'll see you again next month, everybody. Got to get back on the open road. I'm about to go visit um, a site of my childhood, Owl Harbor in Central California. I'm tired. It's been so long. Anyway, we'll talk about more about that in later shows. Talk to you later. So long. Bye-bye.